Hello? Hello. Oh, there I am. A bit of feedback. All right, happy Sabbath, church family. How are you guys doing this morning? Good, good. I don't know about you, but after that worship session, I just felt like I can just, we can just leave, man. That's it. That's church right there. You didn't even hear, need to hear a message. Um, but yeah, I'm privileged to be able to speak again. I thought my preaching appointments were finished, but uh, um, unfortunately, Ray couldn't join us today, so I'm filling in. Um, so yeah, um, preaching again, which means I might have done a good job or they couldn't find anyone else. I'm not sure, but I'm preaching today and um, it's a pleasure to share. I always enjoy preaching and teaching and there will be a bit of both this morning. But uh, this is the last of our What Jesus Says About series. Who's been attending most of the nights? Couple of you guys, thank you to the faithful few who have roughed the, the weather and come out every night. I know there's a couple of you who have been faithful. Thank you so much for turning up and those I know of you who uh, couldn't come out but have been watching on live stream, thank you for your support. Um, this has been a really awesome journey, I think, for me in my own relationship with Jesus. This has really strengthened and helped um, me to grow closer to Him and it's a sad thing that we've ended this session but as Jess has shared with us, we are going to start another series um, so we can, you know, keep growing close. It's not like we'll have this uh, campaign and then just stop it and like, all right, that's it. But we want to keep it going and we want um, to draw closer to Christ and to God as a church family. And so this, yeah, although this is ending, we're looking forward to the new series that's starting. As you can see, the topic for today is heaven. And what, we're, what better way to finish our What Jesus Says About series than on this topic such as heaven. And so there's a picture here of a beautiful um, field. And our planet, Earth, has so many beautiful places, so many beautiful sites. And if it is you know, up there in the, in the most beautiful, beautiful places to visit, they will label it as one of the wonders of the world. And we have, I believe, eight now, is it? Eight wonders of the world? Seven? Eight? One of them, somewhere. Uh, but yeah, <clears throat> planet Earth is such a beautiful place. In New Zealand especially, I enjoy um, all, of, all of the mountains and the, the sheep driving up to wherever you go. You don't have to go far to see a field of sheep. Um, cattle, and it's just beautiful. We live in this beautiful place called Earth. And there's just a photo of, yeah, of, of mountains, and it's not, not so unfamiliar to us as Cantabrians. We've got the beautiful mountains, and there's the uh, Mount is it Cook down, down south. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting there. I'm learning, I'm learning. And so we, we, we're, we're, we're thinking about heaven today, and Notice what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. It says that what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things that God has prepared for those who love Him. Notice that it says what no eye has seen. I mean, we see beautiful, beautiful settings in New Zealand across the world. But it says no eye has seen nor ear has heard and what no human mind has conceived the things that God has what? Prepared for those who love Him. And we like to say that He's preparing, you know, this home, heaven. There's no, nothing on this earth that we can see or no one can tell us. I mean, it's just saying that our imagination can't fully grasp the place that God has prepared for each and every one of us. And I thought of the story of Willy Wonka and Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, how he, you know, was opening up his wrapper and it just saw a bit of shining gold glitter and you see his eyes light up and he's like, I've got the golden ticket, he's waving it around. He goes home to his, this is the old school version, he goes home to his family and his dad, his granddad or one of them, is lying on the bed, and as soon as he sees the ticket, he's like hopping up and dancing around like he doesn't have any um, bad legs, but 
And, and I think they begin to start to imagine what would it be like inside this factory? You know, their minds could be going wild. Oh, is there the most beautiful candies? Or you, you could kind of sense that they would have imagined what it would be like to be in this, you know, this beautiful Wonka factory. And it's kind of the same um, with heaven. God is preparing this awesome place for us, but he says that there's no th- imagination, nothing that we can think of to really grasp the place that God has prepared for us. Matthew chapter 24, verse 36 says, But about that day or hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. We're going to learn a bit about um, what heaven is like, and this suggests that who dwells in heaven? Angels. Yeah. So that, that's the first thing we kind of think of when we think of heaven. Angels, they're the first thing that comes to our mind. The Bible says that this is where the angels dwell. Secondly, in John 6, verse 38, the Bible also says that this is Jesus' words, and he says, For I have come down from where? From heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. So heaven is a place where angels dwell. Heaven is the place where Christ came from, and heaven in, which is suggested in this verse says that Satan came from it. And it says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. So all these different um, things, you know, we learn that the angels lived in heaven. Jesus came from heaven. Satan also came from heaven. And so we get this picture of, of this place called heaven where God reigns and where all the angels are. And if you read the Bible through, you'll see verses that seem kind of strange. And they use the word heaven, but it's referring to a different, um, different thing. So not talking about heaven where we're reading about here. But what are these verses talking about? What kind of heaven is this verse talking about? And here's, um, here's an example of one of those verses. Mark chapter 13 says, He will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds. From the ends of the earth to the ends of the what? The heavens. So which kind of heaven do you think is suggested here? Hmm? It's a different type, eh? We read the next verse. It says, the disciples, James and John, saw this. They asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from where? Heaven to destroy them. This is a funny story. Jesus and his disciples are going to Samaria, and he tells them, tell them that I'm coming to teach and preach, and they reject him. They say, we don't, want to do, we don't want anything to do with Jesus. And so they're like, man, do you want us to call down the fire on this place, Samaria? And they were known as the sons of thunder. These guys are pretty hot-headed, but they said, yeah, call fire down from heaven. Which heaven are they referring to? Is this the heaven where God dwells, or is it another type of heaven? And we don't have to go far to, to understand that when Christ, or when God and Christ and the Spirit created this world, the language in the creation story where God says, um, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And when he's going through the story of the creation account, you'll see that he, when he's creating on day one light, and then he creates the firmament, which is also called heaven. He fills that firmament with what later on in day four, I believe. Day, yes. Stars. And there's another heaven that is shown in the creation account, which he's talking about our actual atmosphere, where the birds fly around. And this diagram illustrates it very well. It says that the first heaven um, is talking about what space? Our earth, where the birds and all of the flying creatures that's there around the first heaven. Then there's a second heaven, which is the the galaxy, the stars, the planets, that's labeled by scholars as the second heaven. And then the third heaven is God's dwelling place. This is the heaven where we were reading about, where the angels dwell, where Christ came from, where Satan fell from. And this is the kind of understanding that we get when we read throughout the scriptures. Um, Use this as a tool to differentiate which heaven the Bible is talking about. And if you have this, it'll be easy to 
think, oh, yeah, it's talking about this heaven or this heaven or this heaven. And it's just, yeah, a good way to remember that, um, that this is, yeah, the heavens, the three types of heavens. Jesus, in his ministry, you'll hear him say a lot of things like, the kingdom of heaven is life. And it's suggested that fish don't know that water exists. Do you think fish know that water exists? Maybe the fish, at least not for the fish that live in the deepest parts of the sea, how would it be easy to explain to a fish that water exists? A fish lives in water, breathes water, dies in water. It lives its whole life in water. How are you to explain to the fish what water is? And it's, the sa- it's kind of like the same thing for Christ. When he came from heaven, he wanted to teach humanity what the kingdom of heaven was like. How was God, how was Christ going to teach us what dry is like if all we know is wet? If all we've lived with is sin, born in sin, die in sin, we, leave, we live our whole lives in sin. How is Christ going to communicate to us what heaven is like? And you see him say things like, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. Or the kingdom of heaven is like a farmer who went out and sowed seeds in the field. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast, which a woman put and made bread. All these different examples of God trying to communicate what the kingdom of heaven is like. And it can kind of get a bit confusing, but when you study them in detail, you'll know that what Christ is sharing is more the principles. The what? The principles principles of the kingdom of heaven rather than what the kingdom of heaven is actually like. For example, the, the, yeah, The the substance, that's right. So I can say this room is very warm, or I can say this room has heaps of chairs if you know what I mean. Yeah, that's what he's communicating in his parables, the the principles of the kingdom of heaven, principles of grace, of mercy, of faithfulness, all these different principles. But he hardly ever talks about what what is actually there in the kingdom of heaven. John chapter 14, verse 1 to 3, says that, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me, my Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. Another tension that you find when Christ is preaching is that, actually in the whole of the Bible, is that we, I grew up in a church that preached Heaven is a place in the future, and that's something that you're going to work towards, and you know, your daily life, you're preparing to get to this place called heaven. And then Jesus comes into the scene, and he says stuff like, the kingdom is near, or the kingdom of heaven is now. And you wrestle with this tension of, is the kingdom of heaven something that we find in the future, or is it something that we experience in the present? And later on, I'm going to help maybe bring a bit of clarity on that tension and how that involves us. But here we see that God is preparing a place for us, a place where there is plenty of of room, where we will live with God, with the angels, with our family members, with our friends. Also, the Bible says that heaven is a place where, where we, we don't get to heaven until Christ comes again. And the Bible talks about a specific resurrection where God is taking us to heaven. And this is explained well in First Thessalonians. Can we read it all together this morning? One, two. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with the loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them 
in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. This is talking about the second coming, where Christ is coming back to take us to this place um, that he's prepared for us. He says the dead in Christ will rise first. And if you, those of you who are there, last time I shared about what the, what the Bible or what Jesus says about the end of life. And we journeyed through, um, is there anything beyond the grave? And we learned that there is, and that our lives today, the choices that we make today, determine whether or not we'll be a part of that kingdom. It says here, um, I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of the heavenly things? And we often ask the question, why didn't Jesus share a lot about what the kingdom of heaven was like? And we get a picture of it in this verse where he says, I, you can't understand what I'm saying in earthly terms. How are you going to understand what I'm saying of, of heavenly things? Maybe that's one of the reasons why um, Christ didn't share a bit about the he heaven and what it was like. And two of the places outside of the Gospels share what heaven is going to be like. So Jesus focused more on the principles, the what? The principles of the kingdom of heaven. Other books of the Bible help give us a bit of insight. So God hasn't left us, you know, wondering, oh, is there going to be this, is there going to be that? He does explain a bit about what it will be like in heaven. And these are really encouraging verses and chapters when we read them gives us a bit of encouragement um, and hope that things that we're going through in this life will soon be an end, and there is a better place that we will be going to. John is on the island of Patmos, and he gets a vision from God about a couple of things that happened in history, and he also gets an, a picture from God, a vision of what heaven is like, and he says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. Here's a picture of, of a new kind of place being formed. And in order for the new to, be, um, to, to arrive, what must happen to the old one? Destroyed or cleansed or recreated, the Bible says that this will happen to this earth. The old, the former things will pass away, the new will come, and this is um, a recreation of, of earth. And I'm no Bible scholar, but here's a diagram that really illustrates a bit about, it gives us a bit of clarity with the events that happen in regards to heaven, in regards to how Everything plays out in the scope of Christ coming and then what happens after that. Um, and this is what they teach. Well, this is what our church believes in. We see that in the last days, um, which we are all a part of, there's going to be a point where Christ returns. And the righteous dead are raised. We read a verse there. It says, The living saints caught up, the wicked are slain, Satan is bound, and the earth is desolated. And there's a thousand years a thousand year period where the righteous are in heaven and the wicked remain dead. Satan is bound by the chains of, so he's just wandering the earth. No one to tempt, no one to fool. He's sitting down to think of his life and how horrible it is. And everything, this is what's going down in this a thousand, thousand years. After that, the Bible says there's a second resurrection. Christ and the saints and the city descend, which is the new heaven which we're reading about. The wicked dead are raised. Satan is loosed. The last judgment is, is placed. Satan and sinners are destroyed, and the earth is cleansed and renewed. And I hope this gives a bit of insight if you are having any doubts of, oh, when, how come the Bible talks about two deaths and two resurrections and all this can be kind of confusing, but if, if we kind of look at this uh, diagram, it gives us a bit of insight where um, it talks about a recreation and that Christ, this new heaven, this new earth, after the thousand years is, is where we are all going to be um, dwelling. But it also talks about judgment and 
the sinners and those who don't choose to follow God, who haven't accepted Christ into their life, shows what, 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 they're going to, what their consequence is going to be. So it does talk about um, this, this destruction of the wicked. And we can often think, oh man, that's, that's a sad picture, you know? Some of our family, some of our friends might be a part of that. It's, like, it's just a horrible thing to think about, um, this hell fire. And the Bible, when you look at it, tells us clearly that it's not an eternal fire, but it's necessary to remove um, sin. And you can imagine, if God lets sin to continue, it'll just grow and bring more death and more. He has to put an end to it. And although it's a, it's, it's a sad thing, it's a necessary thing. And God says, this is what's going to happen. Picture of a sheep there. Revelation chapter 20. We're going to look a bit about what, jo what John is writing. This is the picture of heaven. He says, I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. Books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. So that, that pretty much is the Bible reference for the diagram which we read. And it just it gives a bit of um, textual yeah, truth to what I'm showing on the diagram. So it's not like I make, make this up. It's in the Bible. Um, and that's the verse there. John says that he saw a holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride. Guys, do you remember the day your bride walked down that aisle? Wasn't it the most beautiful sight you've ever seen? No? Oh, <laughs> oh, maybe you shouldn't talk about that. No, no. Um, I'm sure when the, your bride was walking down, you're just like, man, this is it right there. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I can't wait for that day, but hopefully not too far in the future. Jesus says this is the kind of image of, of this new city coming down, this new place called heaven. It's like... We're waiting for our bride, man. This is the day. This is the best day of our lives. This is what we've been looking forward to. This is where all the preparations, all the plans, this is where it comes down to. He also says, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and He will dwell with them. It's not like we're on earth and He's in heaven and we're separated from Him. We're going to be living together with God. Now, I can't even wrap my mind around that. Like, we're going to live with God? Like, what? It's like, what is that going to, like, sup, God? Sup? <laughs> what are you up to today? Like, I don't know, but it's, it's going to be awesome. And there's no separation. We're going to be with God. And that's, that's, so, that's such good news. It says, it says they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. Man, can, how can you begin to imagine what this place would be like, because all we've ever lived with is death, pain, suffering, to think of a place where there's none of that. I think that's why, you know, it says no eye has seen, no ear has heard, nothing's entered to our minds what that place is going to be like. Um, but it's, it's a place that God has prepared for us. It's a special place for you in heaven. And I don't think it'll ever be the same if you're not there. And I believe that God desires for all of us to be a part of that. No more pain, no more death, no more sickness. The, 
John also gives a description of what, it's, what the foundation is going to be. And he says, you know, 2,000, I think 200 kilometers, the width, the depth, the height, begins to explain a bit about what it's going to be looking like. A pearl, as 12 pearls are going to be the gate. Like, that's what the Bible says. 12 pearls will be the gate. Like, hey, small pearl, this must be, ma- like, yeah, you can't, can't really begin to imagine what it's going to be like, but that's what the Bible says. 12 pearls, it's going to be the gate. Um, gold, streets of gold. You've heard the joke before, the guy comes up to heaven, brings a suitcase full of gold, and he's like, what's that in your suitcase? He brings the gold out, and he's like, oh, I brought gold from earth. He's like, oh, you brought some cement. Like, this, this, is what, this is what the Bible says about heaven. Um, it's going to be this place where, just can't imagine it, yeah. It's just imaginable, unimaginable. Isaiah is the other book that describes a bit about what heaven is like. We looked at Revelation and John. This is the other book. It says, I will create new heavens and a new earth. It's kind of similarity with John's writings. The former things will not be remembered nor will they come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. I will rejoice, wait, let me back up, to be a delight and its people a joy. Why don't you turn to the person next to you and just give them a smile, a big smile, (laughs) joy, (laughs) <laughs> I won't say it. But this is, this is what heaven's going to be like, a place of joy. We're going to rejoice over Jerusalem. And taking this is God. He's taking delight in His people. The sound of weeping and of crying will be heard in it no more. Never again will there be an, an infant who lives but a few days. Thank God for that. I mean, we... That I don't even know how to answer that question. What will happen to these children who, you know, they're born for a couple of moments and pass away? Like, a lot of people have asked that question, and it's a valid question. What is going to happen? But the Bible says in heaven there will be none of that. The one who dies at 100 will be thought a mere child. We celebrate 80s, 90s, 100 birthdays. Imagine... A hundred being like the new, what, one day? <laughs> one, one second old, yeah, one hundred. It's like, you can't imagine. It's like, man, it's so different. The one who fails to reach a hundred will be considered a curse. They will build houses and dwell in them. They will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. No longer will they build houses and others live in them or plant and others eat. I know my brother was a, is a builder, and he has been building houses for like four years. Can kind of imagine him building this like mansion. He's like, man, one day that's going to be me in heaven. Like you could imagine, oh man, I wish this was my house, but I'm building it for someone else. It's not going to be like that in heaven. We're going to build our own houses, and it's where we're going to dwell. For as the days of a tree, so will be the days of my people. My chosen ones will long enjoy the work of their hands. They will not labor in vain, nor will they they bear children doomed to misfortune. For they will be a people blessed by the Lord, they and their descendants with them. Before they call, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb will feed together. Some people might have questions, are there going to be animals in heaven? The Bible suggests the wolf and the lamb will feed together. I believe there will be animals. Some people might ask the question, I've got a cat and uh, it passed away. Is it going to be in heaven? I don't know. I think there are going to be animals in heaven. But yeah, that's what the Bible says. That the wolf and the lamb will feed together. The lion will eat straw with, uh, like the ox and dust will be the serpent's food. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountains. One of my, the things I'm looking forward to is riding on either a lion or a rhino or something like that. Just like I, I have dreams of what I'm going to do in heaven. Like this is all the stuff I'm looking forward to. I don't know about you if you have like a bucket list of things when you're going to do in heaven. What's going to be the first thing to do, the second thing, third thing, fourth thing, like all these things. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, maybe I'm the only one. But 
<laughs> yeah, this, this is like starting to feed my imagination. Man, heaven is going to be a good place. And so, yeah, it's hard to imagine. No eye has seen, nor ear has heard, not, no human mind can conceive it. Who, who are the people who will be a part of this place? It says, those uh, whose names are not found written in the book of life are thrown into the lake of fire. The Bible also says that Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. There will be a time of distress such as has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found where? Written in the book of life will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, some to everlasting, oh, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are, who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. The Bible says that if your name is in the book of life, you'll be part of that kingdom. And the Bible says that how you get into this book of life is not a trick question. It's not something hard. God sent His Son, Jesus, to take our penalty and our sin. And it says if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins. If we just accept what Christ has done for us, our names will be in that book. It's not a hard thing. God has given us every opportunity to be a part of this place. You can be there today. We're going to make uh, a call at the end, and you're going to have a decision, a chance to respond to God and, and to tell Him, yes, I want to be a part of that. I want to be a part of that kingdom. We've, we've all heard of William Miller. 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 Who's heard of William Miller? Yep. Some of you, some of you might not. Um, who's heard of the Great Disappointment? Does that ring any bells? Yep. Um, in our history, in the Christian, the history of Christianity, just giving you a crash course in William Miller, um, there was a group of people who thought that Jesus Christ was going to come at a certain date. And this was due to a prophecy which they studied about the sanctuary being cleansed. And they thought that sanctuary was earth. They thought the cleansing meant that God was going to come from heaven. And so they pinned 1844 as the date where Christ was going to come back. So they went out preaching. Christ is coming back in 1844. Prepare your houses. Prepare your... Don't, no more, don't need to work. Don't need to go to school. Just prepare your spiritual life. Christ is coming October 1844. And we're still here today, so that obviously didn't happen. <laughs> And it was coined the great disappointment because so many people had left their jobs, left their everything, sold everything to, to, to believe that Christ was coming back. And when he didn't come, the morning after, everyone was just disappointed. And William Miller was the one who moved, who, who was a part of the leadership who moved that. And of course he would have felt a bit, bit of a shame and disappointment. Um, but this is something that he writes a couple of years after. And he says something very powerful about heaven. And it's, I guess, the main point that I want us to take away from today. He says, I have fixed my mind upon another time. I imagine that he's thinking of heaven. I fixed my mind on another time. And here I mean to stand until God gives me more light. And when is that day? Sometime in the future? He says, no, that is today. Today and today until he comes. And I see who? Him for whom my soul yearns. Yes, we're going to be living in beautiful houses. Yes, we're going to be eating the most beautiful fruit. Yeah, ride with the lions, all this beautiful, these beautiful things. But this is where it's, this is who, this is where it's, what it's all about. Not about the fruit, not about all of the perks. He says, for him, 
him for whom my soul yearns. Heaven is a place where we get to, to fellowship with Christ, where we're going to live with him. That's what heaven is ultimately all about. Doesn't matter if we're living in a cave for all I care. We're with Christ. We're fellowshipping with him. Better is one day in your courts, David says, than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tent of the wicked. It's all about Christ. Christ is the center of heaven. Our focus shouldn't be on all the perks, but it should be fixed around him for whom our souls yearn. And here's a final quote that I want to share with you. This man says, The revelation of Jesus gives us a vast, beautiful panorama of the future dwelling of God with us that exhausts the mind of mere mortals. It is a glimpse into God's future that summons us to bear concrete witness to it when. Now, this is a tension which Jesus was living with and something that the disciples were trying to wrap their heads around. Heaven is a place where we're going to be in the future, but Christ said the kingdom of heaven is now. It's here. This man suggests that if, if, if heaven is something that we believe in in the future, it's something that we will bear concrete witness to when? Now. And so I guess my challenge for us is how are we going to how are we going to usher in the kingdom of heaven now? The Bible talks about this place where there's no poverty, no death, no hatred, no more crying. And I, I'm suggesting to you that we can build that kingdom now, can help people experience that kingdom now. How can we bear concrete witness to this future place now in our lives? How can we bring an end to death? How can we bring an end to sorrow? How can we bring an end to poverty and hunger? I believe that if we believe in heaven as a future place, we will live like that right now. And that, I guess that's my challenge for you today. How is my life bearing concrete witness to this future place now? And uh, I think we don't have any um, response cards. But what I want to do now is just go through these two responses. And it's up here on the screen. And just to think about all that we've talked about, but mainly the point that heaven is a place where we're going to be with Christ, where we're going to be with Jesus. The first response is, Jesus, I know you are the only way to heaven. You've heard the verse, I am the way, the truth, and the life. If anyone wants to come to the Father, they must come through me. I know you are the only way to heaven. There's nothing that I can do. There's no amount of good works that will earn my place in heaven. I'm going to accept that, Christ, you're the only way. And I want to follow you all the way. That's your desire. Just nod in your heart and say, Christ, I want to follow you all the way. The next one says that, Jesus, I want to be with you in that place. I mean, this is a no-brainer. I'm sure all of us want to be a part of that place, this place that God is preparing for each of us in heaven, this future place where we're challenged to bear concrete witness to right now. How can we do that in our own lives? So wherever you are, if, if this is your response, I want to encourage you to stand up. As, as a sign to God saying, yes, I want to be a part of that place. Yes, I want to follow Christ. Yes, I acknowledge that you're the only way. I've been trying to get there, whatever, however, but I understand that you are the only way. That I will follow you all the way. That I want to belong to this place. If 
Father in heaven, Lord, I want to thank you so much that that soon you will take us home. We're not building a life here. We're just pilgrims. We're just walking through. This isn't a place where we want to build our life. We're just passing through. Lord, we know that this is just temporary, that we're preparing for this future home, that you've got rooms for us that you promise in your word that there are going to be so much blessings in heaven. But we want to look beyond the blessings. We want to look beyond the perks. And we want to say, Christ, it's all about you. For whom our soul yearns. We want to be a part of that kingdom, Father. And I want to pray, Father, that you will help us in, in our lives to bear concrete witness to that today. Give us the strength, Lord, to help people experience what heaven will be like right now. We know we can't do it without you, and we need you, Father. And your word says that you will be with us, and you will be in us, that you'll pour out your spirit with abundance, and that we will move forward as a church, proclaiming your gospel, proclaiming your great news. I pray a special blessing over everyone this morning. I want to thank you for your love. Thank you for dying on the cross for our sins. We want to recommit our lives to you, knowing that you are a forgiving God and you're a God of mercy and grace. just want to humble ourselves and say, Lord, take our lives, change us, transform us, and may we leave this place with you in our lives. Prepare us for the kingdom to come. Is our prayer, Lord, in your precious name. Amen. I want to invite the praise and worship team to come up as we sing our final song, 10,000 Reasons. You can stay standing. Let's worship God with this final song.